All right, yeah. Welcome to the Natural Born Hunter podcast. I'm your host, Will Bradley, with my co-host, Phil Mendoza, and today's guest, Aaron, probably the greatest hunter in the world, Snyder. (laughs) Um, So what's up? Oh, nothing nothing exciting on my end. I'm still recovering. Went and bought groceries. Maybe stop by Home Depot. Home Depot. (laughs) Take a little afternoon for yourself. (laughs) Yeah. What about you guys? Uh, I had strongman training this morning, so I went and did that. And I've been trying to not kill myself due to trying to lose weight to make the uh, weigh-ins on Saturday. So that, that's been my day. Salad I'm, I'm, and bullshit. I'm on pace for 20,000 calories in 48 hours. <laughs> 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 Will, I hate to rub it in, man. Uh, but I tell you what, I've been living large the last day and a half. Here, here's the hardest part about losing this weight, right? One, I love carbs. And after talking to Ben Greenfield, it was like, all right, so no carbs, no starches, no um, – there's something else I had, to, I had to lose that I was just like, all right, well, it looks like it's vegetables and a little bit of protein. And the weight has – honestly, it's, it has been dropping rapidly, but I love carbs. And soon the ice cream stand near my house will close. Which means I won't be able to get the twist and waffle cone with butterscotch dip, <laughs> butterscotch dip that I love. And so knowing that that will close in two weeks, and I only have two weeks left, and I'm going to use one of those weeks not eating it is killing me. And Ben said you can't have ice cream. What the fuck does he know? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? What is this for a living? I don't care. <laughs> what kind of fitness expert are you, fucking Greenfield? No ice cream? <laughs> I'll, I'll be right back. My little guy escaped. Oh, that's for for those of you, well, no one knows this. Phil is currently watching his youngest son, and uh, as I'm sure you can imagine, a young child uh, doesn't quite sit there and you know hang out during the podcast like full grown adults would. No, Jody's watching me. So yeah, she's keeping me in this here. <laughs> she keeps one of those kids corrals up so you can't get too far away from the webcam. No, she's got a big fucking stick. She <laughs> kicks the shit out of you. She whacks me when I get out. Mm-hmm. Listen to her. Yeah, she's excited about that. <laughs> uh, I know. I think. I know. Yeah, you know, I had. That's what Jody's a dietitian, so she does the meal planning for us for the most part. And I eat clean like ninety percent of the time, but that ten percent, I fuck that up royally. Well, give me the uh, give me the weekly layout of the Aaron Snyder meal plan. Well, when I do it right. Generally, well, right now we're not trying to eat too many carbs. She doesn't eat any. I'm eating some. But generally in the morning I wake up and I have steel cut oats and Greek yogurt. Mm -hmm. That's right after I go to the gym. And then shortly, I don't know, two hours after that, give or take, I'll usually have hummus with pretzel crackers, something like that. And then at lunch, if I remember, I have chicken breast and salad. And then for dinner, we pretty much have some kind of a – neither one of us are great cooks. Love you, dear. So <laughs> it's usually like turkey burger with some shit mixed in, nothing fancy. So that's pretty much it. Nothing right. great. And the 10%? Cookies. I, I eat the shit out of a cookie. Now we talking Oreos, chocolate chip. No, it's chocolate going? chip cookies. Yeah. I eat those. Well – Lately, they're not horrible for you, but there's these peanut butter bars at Vitamin Cottage, and I eat those like a fat kid eats cake. It's bad. Like, I got to stop eating them. The other day, we cleaned out the front of my Forerunner. I, I probably had a truck payment and peanut butter wrapper bars on the floor. <laughs> it was bad. At, at the Vitamin on a nice Cottage. Truck. Decent truck. <laughs> I've never heard of the Vitamin Cottage before. Well, as you're in New York. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well you know. Just like a vitamin shop, is that what it is? No. Uh, well, I mean, how would you explain? Colorado's got a lot of hippies, right? Right, right. okay. okay. Green and a lot of people, uh, a lot of tree huggers, right? It organic. sounds like the kind of place you get your protein and molested at the same time. Pretty much. You can't throw a hippie in Boulder without hitting a Subaru. I mean, it's pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, vitamin yeah, sure. is like an organic place. We have a lot of Subarus in upstate New York. It's actually the official car of New York. Or do they just the Subaru tell every state that? I don't know. We, there's a lot of Toyotas and Jeeps here. We have a, we Will, have a can lot you do me a favor? Can you bend the brim of that hat? 
I could. I could, Aaron, but I've won in the past day, yesterday, wearing this hat. I won two shoots. Obviously, it's a lucky hat, and this is going to stay the way it is. That's where else I'll rub the luck off it. It has nothing to do with my skills as an archer. It has everything to do with this hat. Well, I, you know what? I got so infatuated with that flip and flat brim. I didn't even see the trophy. I was, <laughs> bit of photo, and I was like, man, I saw, man, he needs to spin that brim. You know what happened is I saw a picture uh, that Casey posted of you in a Mountain House flat brim, and I thought I need to be just like my hero. Maybe if I get a Mountain House flat brim, I will be good to Snyder. And then I did. Won that trophy. Then I won 20 bucks at the night shoot, and I was like, holy shit, he's on to something. <laughs> uh, well, little did Phil know when he went after the Ram, I undercover brother incognito flattened this bitch. <laughs> and then before he came back, I bent the shit out of it again. <laughs> you, you come over, you're all hot and sweaty. He's like, what have you been doing over here? You're like, oh, nothing, nothing. You're rolling the rim as fast as you can. <laughs> I happened to get a new Mountain Ops hat in the mail when I was gone, and I proceeded to immediately get the can of green beans and put the rubber bands around that bitch to to bend that brim because I'm really not a flatty guy myself. So my Mountain Ops hat um, is is in preparation or is in uh in the molding phases right now. To uh, that that's an interesting thing you bring it up. I think guys do. Ha- I mean. Maybe it's just you and I, but I also have rituals for bending. When I do have a bent brim hat, that it will have to sit in a cup of water. Like, the water will soak in, and I put the hat in to take the shape of it, and it'll have to sit there for a week before I take it out. That's my ritual for bending the brim. Uh, 31. And then, Phil, you're 36? Yeah. See, everything went to shit right now. 27? <laughs> uh, no, I'm 39, 38, 38, 38, 39. Anyway... So what you're doing shit? I'm old. Yeah, I'm an old part. But uh, the flat brim thing started somewhere, somewhere between like I don't know, well, thirty six, seven, eight, nine time frame to thirty two. Straight out of Compton. Yeah, well, NWA that movie's out. We're gonna go watch it. But are you? I think I'm gonna go watch it. Don't go to the well, it's like a prerequisite. You had to sag your shit and flatten your brim. I'm like, dear, we can't go. We're going to have to wait for Voodoo or Netflix. <laughs> do you want me to talk to Aaron or do you want me to talk to Casey? Maybe we can get you some gear that you can go in well, incognito. I am like a shockingly Caucasian and I look like a white supremacist. <laughs> so me going to NWA is probably not a good idea. Here's the thing, though. All, all the black people would look over at you and be like, Man, you must really love NWA. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Which <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. drinking? Because you're not just white; you're a cracker at this point. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you're on the spectrum of whiteness. You're at the edge. Yeah, yeah, I'm on the far end of it. Now, Phil, you you might be a your little tanner in complexion. I think you'd be fine. Yeah, I think uh, I kind of blend in well. With, with both categories, you know. See, I had to wear enough SPF 100. I about turned myself into Hispanic, dude, because I fried the shit out of myself the first time we went up. I had chunks of skin peeling off my nose. And uh, so this time I actually brought sunscreen. I didn't get burnt as bad. Plus, Phil killed it quick, so I wasn't sitting on the side of a mountain getting fried. So that worked out good. It does yeah. work out good. So what was the hunt like? What's it like going out there with Phil, the Iceman Mendoza? It's, it's everything you had heard of dreamed of it being. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was good. I, uh, well, we went, I mean, we had a plan, right? And what looks good or, or doable on Google Earth and uh, maps turned into a shit sandwich on the way in. It was a rough one. Um, and then uh, we, we slept on rocks, Will. We slept on rocks. He it's definitely stepped up on rocks the, first, the second night. He, he got screwed in the sleeping accommodations there. I mean, I tried to play it off like, hey, which spot do you want with my shit taking up the whole good spot? <laughs> All your stuff's on this moss bed. Meanwhile, he's got these jagged cracks. Like, you know, you could take it over there if you, if you don't want you know, me to move my stuff, which would be horribly inconvenient for me. Yeah. No, it was the first time we went out. We if we should have probably if we would have had the sleeping accommodations this go around we should have had bivvies and tarps. Instead, this time we brought bigger well they were bigger tarps. He brought a mega tarp. I brought a super tarp, 
and we really needed the bivy situation for this go around because this area where we go normally you're in cliffs and deer beds and shit which is what we were in and uh but the first trip we had big huge like field of dreams grassy areas where we were camping and so and phil had the motel six and i i had the <laughs> A little bit above that. I, I had a Howard Johnson. I don't know, but it was a small, <laughs> a small tarp, and it pissed rain like pitchforks. And anyway, it rained a lot. So this trip, we brought bigger shelters. Didn't rain at all, and we slept in deer beds. And and Phil slept on rocks the second night. Yeah, it was. Uh, it, it, it was interesting. I, I mean, I think I was on a a pretty good incline. I actually put my pack underneath my knees to try to well, somewhat level myself out. After a couple hours of that shit, it was uh, it was not comfortable. So it was interesting, but yeah, we come we come over this cliff and we're we're about getting ready to glass. And Aaron looks around. And he says, "Why don't we camp here?" And I'm looking around to see nothing but a field of rocks. And I was like, <laughs> "Well, shit, okay." <laughs> uh, it was closer to the top. I was tired of climbing. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say he sure. It feels like you sure we can't find a rockier spot to sleep on. <laughs> it, it, it was it was either there or we would have been rolling down the hill because there was nowhere else to camp up there. Yeah, we would have had to drop elevation. And normally I bring an ice axe, like a walking stick ice ice axe, for good reason because you got to hack out a bed. Well, like a moron, I didn't bring it this time. I just just brought regular walking sticks, and of course we had bedding areas we needed that ice axe to dig out, but. I um I'll post some pictures up. I got I had a mushroom patch I slept in. In fact, I used one for a pillow. That thing fuck my back, right? It's just a huge mushroom. I was gonna eat it to help with the pain. I thought it might have been a pain reliever, but I decided <laughs> not to. <laughs> Next thing you know, Eric can see and smell <laughs> colors. See the them chickens? <laughs> We're in the spirit world, you asshole. They can't see us. <laughs> Getting in touch with three-year-old Aaron up on the mountain, that would be a tough one for you, Phil. Yeah. It was It was. was kind of – I'm not remembering everything clearly on the hike in from, from the, the weekend. So if you ask about how the hike in or the hike out went, Will, I'm still kind of trying to patch those pieces together because there was a lot of black spots in between. Oh, it was easy, um, easy and quick? It for like six hours. <laughs> yeah. No, it was bad, man. I mean, we were hiking in, and we're looking at the map. We're like, oh, yeah, we, you know, we should come over this ridge. We get to the lake that we want to get to, and it just seemed to freaking go forever and ever. And we're side hilling this hill, and we magically stumbled upon this uh, little stream that water just coming out of the mountain, like, at the perfect time. And um, I think we came to conscious a little bit there at that point and had a little water. And then when we, we kept going, it was I, – I, I mean – there was many words to describe it, but the most G- PG-13 rated is it was a shit sandwich with no bread. It was just that <laughs> it's what it was all the way in and all the way down. It, we all hard, know the bread. The bread it's hard to, part of the sandwich. <laughs> it's hard to explain to people. When he drew the tag, I'm like, I was dropping F-bombs like, dude, this place is horrible. I've hunted all over the world. This place sucks. It's steeper than the back of Christ said it is bad everywhere you go. And he saw it the first time, but like this time it was just, you know, the first time we went in this time when he and I went in, uh, but the first time we had Braden with us, Braden Forsyth. And, uh, we went in a much better way the first time we got dropped off from the top and, We didn't have that option this time, so we were like, we're going to go from the bottom. And a buddy of mine that drew the tag last year who'd been giving us some intel, he's like, don't do it. Don't do it. (laughs) And I'm like, ah, whatever. So we're tough. Um, Well, holy shit. I mean, we started climbing, and we there was two ways to to make this approach. And for people that don't understand, the trailhead was at 7,800 feet. And by the time our trek was over, we were at 12.9. And that was in less than five miles to, to get there. So it's it's vertical the whole way up. Plus, you know, 45, 50-pound packs, not a lot of water. So you either bump your pack weight up, two, three, four liters, whatever you need to carry in to add more weight or take a Nalgene and hope you can find water. And uh, anyway, we got up to we, – we, we 
I was trying to round the horn into this one lake for a water source, and, and I screwed that up pretty good. I ended up probably four or 500 vertical feet above it. We were looking down, and then at that point, that was like a 50-degree slope where you're trying to side hill, and we had to try to figure out if we wanted to go up and over and around or down, and we started to go down, but there was cliffs, so we turned around and went back up, and we got a ways up where we could actually make a side hill approach and keep not lose so much altitude and side hill into this basin, which is what we did. And then we basically just passed out there and ate as much as we could. And then uh, the next morning we climbed up, I don't know, gained another thousand. What did we get? Uh, a thousand feet? Yeah, yeah. ish. Well, yeah, 1500 maybe. Cause we, yeah, we got to right. that high peak. Remember we went, we went straight up first. Yeah. I saw a couple <clears throat> deer, three deer, whatever. Anyway, we, it kind of, we were, rolling pretty slow in there because we didn't know exactly where the sheep were so we were glassing pretty methodically and then we got to like the the happy spot where we wanted to be and then uh i guess i went forward and phil stayed there and i only went maybe 100 150 yards forward because it kind of terraces i didn't i want to make sure sheep weren't there and i was actually going to come back and just tell phil like hey i'm going to sit up here and glass for a while and then i saw the get your fat ass down symbol i see sheep so i <laughs> kind of low crawled over or whatever and then um he saw the ram and and it was far enough away that you couldn't tell in binoculars if it was when it was facing you if it was a ram or not and then i actually went to grab my spotter and, and phil saw it he said yeah it's a ram and then uh shortly after that he was hauling ass side hill and on a fit i don't he got over there fast into the uh into the sheep and then i took some photos and posted on facebook where he and their one of the rams are in the same photo and it, at that point i could see him it was funny because i don't think he knew i could see him and uh i'm watching this sheep watch phil for a second and i'm like oh man the gig's up we're fucked and then the bet the, the sheep laid down and i was like oh well he must be part ninja and then i, I saw I phil. gave him those bedroom eyes <laughs> yeah, he saw he saw phil and was like oh boy i've been waiting for you oh uh, well then Phil went straight up this cliff, and I'm like, well, he must be able to see something that I, I can't. There's obviously more sheep in there. And then I see a couple banana heads bouncing, bouncing around on the cliffs, and uh, I then I lost Phil. And I think I heard his bow go off, and at some point his bow went off. I, tech, I, I posted on Facebook. I said, I think he shot one. And uh, then I didn't – I saw some sheep run, but I didn't see – like I didn't have the view, obviously, he did. So I, other than uh, – at that point, I knew something was either shot at, hit, wounded, or dead, one of the others. So I kind of gathered my shit and started working my way, you know, towards him. And then I got over there, and I heard him yell, man, I smoked one. And uh, he's like, it's not bad, man. It's pretty dang good. And then I got over there, and I was like, oh, shit, that's an old ram because <laughs> it's nine-and-a-half-year-old ram. But uh, but I don't know. Obviously, I couldn't see everything, so Phil can probably tell a lot better version of what happened right there. No, it was it was just that man. When we saw him from the distance, and I, <clears throat> I kind of made the approach. I got to a point where I knew I can probably see something and, and maybe stay out of line of sight of them. And when I got to that point, there was it, it was kind of a little rolling hill, so I I can go further. Well, I went further, and like Aaron said, I come around this little corner, and I could see that freaking small ram staring at me. And I just kind of hugged the hill for it. It wasn't more than a minute or two, and yeah. uh, and he bed he bedded down. Well. Once he bedded down, that's when I, I said, well, I'm going to go up and over, try to get, you know, it's, I, I, had, I knew there had to be more rams around. You know, when Aaron and I had talked before, and he was just telling me about how sheep, the behavior of, of sheep, he's like, they'll bed in all different directions, and they'll, they'll all kind of look out for each other. So I went up and over, and as soon as I came over the top, I seen what I thought was the same ram that was bedded feeding, and it happened to be a different one. So he fed off a little bit. Well, I went up and over another rock. And when I came over that, that's when I came face to face with that freaking first ram, bedded down, staring at me at 65 yards. And I thought it was, I thought it was all but done. But then he, uh, he gets up, didn't know what to do. He jumped on a little cliff behind him, and I think that's what Aaron can see him dancing around on a little cliff up there. Yeah. And uh, and I just waited, and I didn't move, and I waited, and finally he kind of moved off to where he couldn't see me. And then I was going to stand up just to try to get closer to over the edge. And I stood up, and I seen two rams, two bigger rams just right below me. And I, I got a quick range on them, man, and I just immediately hooked on my release, drew back, stood up, and, and it was steep. I mean, it was 
looking at the cut chart again, I should have cut 12 yards, I think, 12, 12 to 13 yards. I, I kind of, in my head real quick, figured like 11-ish, 12 yards. But I, I, I mean, it was 30, 34, 35 yards what I shot him for. And I was looking at the chart again afterwards. I should have, it should have been 33 and change, I think, what I should have shot him for. So I was within a yard. Um, for what the cut chart was saying, but it, I mean, I plugged him. He didn't go maybe 25 yards and and piled up, but it was <clears throat> it happened quick, man. I, and sometimes it's better that way. It doesn't give you any time to think, you know, when it when stuff just comes up and you just kind of react. But I tell you what, it, nothing but respect for the guys that get that kind of stuff done and and you know with with the bow because it's we could have tagged out first day with the rifle, you know. We Aaron spotted some sheep, and we got a couple. Well, we got 200 yards or so. I I did by the time I kind of came around. But right. <clears throat> it's tough country. It's I mean, we just kept talking about it. it's like man, it's 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 so, you you climb up a damn hill or a mountain, I should say, and you get to the top and you look down, and you're like, holy shit, you know. And then you climb down and you look back up, you're like, we just came down that shit, you know. It, it it's it's hard to d- describe. I mean, you look at stuff and you're like, you can't climb up there, you know. It's like it's not. It's a grassy patch. It's a little freaking grassy <laughs> patch. <laughs> and it, it's, 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 yeah, it's just so hard to describe because, I, I mean, there's a couple pictures that, that, that we've, that I think I've posted one and then Aaron's posted a couple and you look at it and you're like, you can't get up there. You know, you just, you, it looks like you can't hike up there. And I think a couple of times we shouldn't have hiked up or down some of the freaking mountains we came down because Aaron, we come down a couple of them, Aaron's like, yeah, I, good thing nobody got jacked up right there. That was that was not good. But, but you know, it, it just you, you know you do you be you're as careful as you can. You watch your step. You you know you kind of make the best path you can, and and everything worked out, man. I just but I, I'm kind of like with Aaron. He's like, yeah, I think that's the last time I want to come up here and hunt sheep. You know, it's just <laughs> if, if I carry a lot, it's never good. But this was by far the worst, just because any one thing. Wasn't have been bad, but all of them together. Because Phil's leaving out, we had to climb back up the fucking mountain, <laughs> down on the other side, go to camp, then come back up and over to the sheep after he shot it with very little. Like we got back to camp, I was out, I, I was about ready to drink my own piss. Right, I didn't have much water <laughs> left, and I really wanted to have top ramen and tuna. So I'm sitting there weighing out ramen and tuna or coffee in the morning. I'm like, I'm gonna have some ramen, and then uh, I just poured a bunch of Yeti and Enduro in my mouth and took a swig of the last water I had in the morning. But anyway, it was, uh, you know, there's no trees up there. So we had to hang the meat in the rack from a rock, um, like a, you know, cliff. We climbed up and then hung the rope down and hung it, hung it up. Well then, uh, you know, it was, it's about like, you know, ranging it or whatever, 37 to 50 degree slope that we climbed down with the waist. So we had about a hundred, to 120 each in our packs with gear and the sheep meat and the cape and the head and everything. And so, so here was the other shit sandwich, right? We parked and went up the one way and then he shot maybe one third around the, the mountain. He shot it the other way. So then we dropped down the one drainage and, uh, which looked all right. I mean, it was okay, I guess, but <laughs> when we, <laughs> When we left, there's no trees. When we got to the truck, there's cactus. That's how much elevation you drop. So it started off a a 45 to 50 degree slope, which I've got photos of straight down. And then it went into willows. And then it went into a forested pinch point with a creek that we're having to hop back and forth across the creek. And then, uh, you know, we got to the bottom and uh, it was like, uh sticker bushes and shit like i'm all like i still got cuts on my arms because it was um cactus sticker bushes and and it was i was sweating like mark Furman at the million man march it was like 104 (laughs) degrees with no freaking shade and then we're still a mile from the fucking truck so it was like we had to go up and over up and over and finally i mean i look back a couple times and i could just see sweat just pissing off phil's face and i'm like I don't have any water left either. I got to be <laughs> that bad. This isn't good. And I've, you know, with the military and everything else, been pushed to a point of where my body fails, right? You, like you start to learn where your mind can only go so far. And I'm like, when we were coming down, I'm like, I got three, four hours left in me. New no problem. I can keep doing this with, you know, 120 pounds. Well, we got out of those trees and got in that sun. That shit got cut in half. I'm like, 
a couple hours, I'm going to pass right the fuck out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't, Bill wasn't saying nothing, so I don't know how he was feeling. He was just going. But. Well, and, you know, it was, it was just the, the whole – you know, the just put one foot in front of the other with me. It was, you know, the the feet and and even now my legs are a little sore because I went down some stairs a couple times in the last couple of days and my legs are a little bit tight. But um, my feet, the bottom of my feet is what was really just from the the rock and the terrain and and everything else. That's what I can still feel a little bit sore right now more than anything. <clears throat> but it was just that man. It was what we, we it was almost six hours on our we had that weight on our back coming down and didn't stop very much either no i mean we we stopped to get water uh, what twice check the map and then we stopped maybe one or uh, one or two other times for all the five minutes to kind of catch our breath and and um uh, and just re to have a small snack and keep moving because it it was it was non-stop and it was non-stop just bullshit but it was good man i mean you know i talked to Braden this morning and and he was we were talking about it and i was like man i I wouldn't trade nothing for it, you know, and even, you know, even my dad, Aaron and I joke around a little bit because my dad, he's kind of, he's a little bit of a, <clears throat> let's say an optimist, you know, he's like, oh, there's always bigger rams, there's always bigger elk, there's always bigger something, you know, so he's looking at it, you know, my ram, and he's like, well, that's good, but there's bigger ones, and I'm like, look, <laughs> if there was a bigger one out there, and, you know, and I would have had to hike another 100 yards, no, I'm shooting this one again, you know, this is the <laughs> one that I'm going to shoot, and, uh, but it was good. I, I wouldn't exchange, I, you know, trade nothing for, you know, no part of it other than maybe a, a few small things. But it was, it, it's one of those experiences that you you can't ever uh, put a price tag on. You know, the getting a tag and, and maybe going and getting an, outf get an outfitter and, and you're paying a lot of money to go on a hunt like this, I don't think it would be half as rewarding as, as what this was, you know. It's just nothing against outfitters or nothing against paying for a hunt it's just i mean we from start to finish you know like aaron said we had you know aaron's been up in the area hunting we got another buddy that hunted it last year so we got a few tips and aaron had some experience from that unit in the past but there was nothing uh that was as pure of a do-it-yourself hunt as you can get in the most extremes you know it's what it was and i i think uh what people don't realize or maybe not realize but uh i think it's less than 10 percent success rate for archery in that unit actually i'm positive and, and we've got a buddy that drew a tag in there a guy we know that shot a good ram in there too uh as well and uh he said the same you know most people even if you drew the tag if 100 people drew the tag 95 of them aren't even making it in there unless they get an outfitter that packs them in on horseback and then even still it's pretty difficult to get uh, you know, to where we were, but I think, um, the get like my buddy, uh, buddy, Mike Clay, the guy that he owns a bunch of like, NWT outfitters in Nahanni Butte up in, uh, the Northwest territories. And he, he's like, dude, eight and a half. That's he grain grain that in my mind, eight and a half year old Ram. That's a mature Ram. That's a respectable Ram. You just want to kill one. that's eight and a half. And, and the one Phil kills nine and a half, which is cool. And it's, it's got crazy mass. It's broomed off on the one side, but it's, well, I mean, for me, in the way that I am, and you know, whatever, I'd rather see a do-it-yourself, you know, ram killed. It's eight and a half, nine and a half, ten and a half than a, a tame ram that a guy paid four hundred fifty thousand dollars for, which is what the governor Montana governor's tag will go for four hundred fifty thousand oh, dollars. This was oh. a lot more. Yeah, yeah. Sheep hunting is kind of a click. It's it's the uh, the boys' club. And that boys club has a lot of money in it. So doing it yourself was a cool thing for me. It sounds like sounds Cecil was cheap. Cheap. Oh, shit. I'm not kidding you, man. I, I go to the cheap show, right? And, like, some of the guys that I was able to participate in their hunts in the territories and other areas, you know, they, they wipe their ass with $100 bills, right? They don't give a shit. I mean, you're, oh, go ahead, Aaron, $200,000, you know. Are you kidding me? You know, <laughs> oh, it was a good Fuck year. Three fifties. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, I don't, and it was a real eye opener for me. And this is what, without getting myself into more trouble and stirring the pot, some no, of the no, issues. Do. Yeah. Some of the issues I've had with some of the other companies basically saying that um, I'm not a good enough hunter to be in the position I'm in because I don't shoot big enough animals. Um, and that, uh, well, my thing was, and, and I talked about this on the, the other podcast I do, 
If I pay for female companionship, that doesn't mean I've got game. That just means I got a shitload of money. But if you go and you get laid at a bar every night, you've got some skills, right? That's true. Now, if you've got, well, and I'll if use a sick analogy. Up, put it this way. If you're picking up sixes, sevens, and eights every <laughs> night at the bar, right? I'm I'm giving Aaron some higher higher points than maybe others would, but let's say he's picking up six and sevens and eights every night at the bar. I would say that takes way more skill than a guy dropping a hundred bucks for a dime piece. The guy that gave me this analogy, he's been in the years in this in the hunting industry, been on TV since time began, right? And he's a super super good guy. He's a good friend of mine. I'm not going to mention his name, but he is funny <laughs> when he's drinking. And somebody had mentioned to him about. Um, you know, what I do in the industry and the do-it-yourself thing and that it's kind of stupid, um, not stupid, but do-it-yourself hunters use do-it-yourself hunting as an excuse for shooting mediocre animals. And so he so he was telling me this in my defense to the, you know, the guy that was talking crap about me. This guy came over to me, the friend of mine. He's like, well, the first thing I told him was, I think he should come talk to you in person because I conked him right in the head. But two, he's like, Aaron, the way I look at guided hunts and private land hunting is kind of like prostitution. He's like, if you go into a bar, you may pull a chick, you may not. It just depends. He's like, but you go to a whorehouse, you're getting some ass. He said, and with enough money, you're going to pick what she looks like. And that was his analogy to some of the hunts you go on in the territories or Africa and from my experience, I found that to be very true. Not to say there's anything wrong with that. I mean, if I had a ton of money, I'd probably do it too. But if you take Phil and I, Braden, all the people who worked on this sheep, physically it already cancels out 99% of the population, physically just getting there. And the fact Phil's got two kids, a wife, a shop, a normal business, everything podcast. he has going on. What's that? A, a podcast. podcast. With everything he has going on and then trying to make time for that, compared to a guy that can go to the territories, you fly a freaking helicopter over the animals the day before, so you don't need to wonder where that shit's at. You look at them, you land, and then you walk over and shoot them the next day. Is he the guy that does that, the ultimate hunter, or does he just have a shitload of money? Well, I mean, I'll leave that up to each person. I'm just saying that do-it-yourself hunts to me are – it's way cooler because the amount of effort you got to put into it. The way I see it is this. this. Hey, do you have uh, headphones there? And I'm getting some feedback on you. Is it like wind I, or something? No, I can hear me through through your speakers. No, I don't. I don't have. Um, hold on, let me try. All my high tech gear is at Kafaru. I don't know if this will help or not. <clears throat> hold on. Yeah, 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 that, that killed it. Yep, That's perfect. Yeah, okay. so, so the way I've always viewed it is pretty simple. The the way you describe uh, hunting at that end, it sounds more like you're grocery shopping for animals than actually hunting an animal. And the way what I saw you and, and Braden and Phil do to me, that's that's the pinnacle of DIY hunting. It's going out there in taking everything you have to come back to get a successful animal. And even when you didn't get an animal, it still seemed like the best adventure and time you could go out there and have. Yeah. Yeah. It, I, I hunt both private and public land, right? I mean, I, I'm not shy about it. I, I don't have, um, because of the lifestyle I choose to live with having multiple businesses and everything else, I don't have as much time as I'd like to to go out and, and you know, pursue a do-it-yourself hunt every time out. So there's when I have the opportunity to pay a few bucks to go on a private land, te you know, hunt, I do. When I, you know, like Nebraska, I'll pay a few bucks to go. The guy's already got the sets hung up. You know, it's got some, a few, you know, a few hundred acres of private land, and we go hunt it. So I, I hunt both sides of it. But I can tell you that I shot at a ram that was smaller than the one I took the first trip out and missed, missed him, you know, it, long shot, whatever. But I would have been just as excited to take that ram home as I am I was to take this ram home because of the experience and what it, the, the work it took to get it done. You know, on the flip side, <clears throat> you know, with the private land hunting, 
like Aaron said, you know, if you have, if, if people have the money to spend the guys that wipe their ass with hundred dollar bills and go do that, I can't say I wouldn't do it if I, if I had their kind of money, I probably would, you know, I don't have that money. I have a little bit of money that I can spend on some hunts. So I kind of dabble in both. And, and I can tell you that this terrain, this country is the hardest I've ever hunted as far as, um, you know, the experience, yeah, it's probably the going to be one of the, the best memories I've had. I will have hunting, period. But a, a, on the flip side, you know, it, it, if I stumbled across a, a large stack of $100 bills, I wouldn't wipe my ass with it. I'd probably go try to – I'd probably call Aaron and, and, and have him, you know, get me in contact with his buddy Clay. And I, and I may go try to, you know, go to the Northwest Territories and, and, and chase another ram because, you know – you don't get a tag like this every day. It's, it's, it's actually pretty, you know, eight to 15 years, depending on where you're applying that you can draw a tag, but I'm hooked, man. I mean, that kind of, that kind of country and that kind of hunting, I don't think I can do it every day, every time out, you know, for months on end, but you know, to, to dabble with that kind of hunting, it's a, it's an experience you can't describe. You know, like I said, we, we try to explain the terrain and how steep it is and how hard it is to hike in there. But until you actually get in there and do it, it's words, words don't do it justice. Yeah, I would agree with that from, I've tried to explain it to guys before and, uh, not done a very good job, but I, I can say there's nothing wrong. Like with what Clay does, it was a fun time for me and, you know, it's a business for him and it's, it's an opportunity for guys that maybe, maybe couldn't, uh, normally do a sheep hunt. It gives them a great opportunity to take a sheep and there's nothing wrong with, any of that. I think the issue I have is, is a, a guy doing you do it yourself hunt and putting everything he's got into it, kind of leaving it all out, you know, on the field, so to speak. And uh, I've, I've heard guys uh, a couple years ago, a guy shot a half curl off of a S32, and there was a guy talking crap about it. This guy's up there in jeans, broke as a joke, barely could afford to go. And he went in there and he got it done. And he didn't shoot a giant ram, but I mean, the dude had to borrow money to get gas to get up there. So he did pretty damn good overall. And uh, that's the kind of thing that bugs me is uh, people that do wipe their ass with $100 bills that talk down to guys that do do-it-yourself hunts. You know, there's nothing wrong with either one of them, but respect them both, I guess. And, and, that, and that's the thing. I'm not – I wouldn't talk down anybody who wants to spend their money on whatever they want to spend it on, no matter how much they make, right? But if you're going to sit there and think you're better than everyone else because you can drop, you know, a hundred grand and go hunt wherever you want, you know, I, I don't necessarily think that's true. Uh, I think there's, you, you know, what Phil did this weekend, he could not, not have paid money to get or what he did the past two weeks. There's no amount of money he could have paid for that experience uh, to that, uh, the spiritualness behind it, you know what I mean? All the shit he's learning while doing it. You can't just go out and pay a guy to, you know, drop you off where you want, point at the animal you need to shoot, and then take care of everything for you. It, yeah, the the one-liners that Aaron drops are, are priceless in, in itself. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, and, and you know, Aaron, Aaron and I have talked a few times in the past, and, you know, he, he's um, – He's, he's been on a few more podcasts, you know, as of late with, with, uh, with the Gritty Bowman, and then he's been on with us a couple times. But, you know, there's some guys that, that look at Aaron and, and don't know Aaron, and they think that, ah, oh, this guy's an asshole. But I guarantee you something, if you're privileged enough to hang out on a hunt or a hike or whatever, there's no shortage of laughs. It's, it's, I don't want to say it's grab ass. It's not grab ass. It's just... <laughs> it's just freaking comical. I mean, we're we're out there having a good time, you know. Aaron's dropping one-liners and then telling us some of the stories from from his <laughs> past. That I I tell you what, man, it's just it, it's uh, it's never a dull moment. And um, like I said, the the experience that I I I'm not I carried a freaking notebook around, man. And it was I was I was keeping notes of the day's events. And half the time I'm jotting shit down that Aaron was freaking dropping on one-liners. You know? <laughs> I, I mean, it was freaking comical. But I, I do talk too much. No, I talk it, a lot. <laughs> it, it was good, man. Like I said, there, there's a, um, I don't know. It, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I got it. I got it done, and we got it done because it wasn't an individual. You know, Aaron, Aaron carried more weight than I did on the way out. You know, he, uh. He carried most of the meat out, or all the meat out, and, and I had the cape and a few things. But there, 
you know, to have guys like that with you to 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 suffer with you on that adventure. Um, like Aaron said, that you know, just the country we were up in already eliminates most of the people that that hunt because they're just not prepared to handle that. So, um, you know, having Braden and Aaron up there, man, it's a uh, it was cool. I, I'm looking forward to it. And, you know, elk, elk, elk and deer season here is, what, two weeks away? It's two weeks from yesterday, right? Yep. So um, kind of recouping a little bit and, and excited to get back after it. I, I actually have one more wilderness tag in New Mexico um, for an elk. But, Aaron, you, you hunt, is the area you hunt wilderness too, isn't it, for, for deer and elk? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, uh, pretty remote country. Yeah. I'm um, – I think I got to fly out to, uh, to Botech. I'm doing a seminar this Friday and then I fly back Saturday and then we're going to haul, uh, haul ass in there and dump a bunch of food off. Cause I don't want to have to pack it all in. And then, uh, but it's like, it's not, it's not, it's farther than what Phil and I just did, but it's, uh, it's a, the, the terrain's not quite as bad, but I found a pretty good deer in there. And, uh, I think even Lance Banning, he might go with us. I was trying, I was trying to talk to him earlier and, I don't know with Lance. Lance is like the coolest guy in the world, but he wouldn't say shit if his mouth was full of it. I mean, he's, I can only imagine him in combat. Hey, they're shooting at us. You better shoot back. Because I'm like, he's just so mellow. Like yesterday, I'm talking to him on the phone, and he's like, hey, Aaron, uh, I've got a newborn, and, uh, and and my other kid's running around in the, in the grocery store. I, I should go. I'm like, are you saying you got to go? Oh, okay, cool, man. Call me back later because I can't. Most people, I guess maybe because I don't smile enough or whatever, but I, I literally could talk but not out of hiding. Like I talk too much, and I'm sure Phil, because he, when he wakes up, I don't sleep much, right? So I'm like, hey, Phil, what's going on, man? How are you feeling? Your feet all right? You feeling good? You want to stretch? What's going on? What do we want to do today? He's like, yeah, well, you know, so I never shut up. Well, Lance, he doesn't talk, right? I'm like, well, I think this is what we're going to do, whatever, whatever, and um, – Anyway, it, it should be an interesting, interesting trip. Sorry, my wife's making fun of me. But uh, I tell you what, though, as far as talkers go, I would say Brian Martin, who he owns Asian Canadian Mountain Outfitters, he could he could out talk me, even on my best day. And Stephen Lathrop, okay. Stephen Lathrop talks so much from Lathrop and Sons Boots. I shouldn't say this online, but I'm gonna admit guilt now. I've got a secret. Hopefully, Stephen doesn't listen to this. Uh, I'm talking to him. I hang up in the middle of mid sentence, and then I put that fucker on airplane mode. So it seems like I lost service. <laughs> <laughs> that's a secret for all of you. There's a little nugget. So that's the that's the best way to get off the phone with him because he will talk and talk and like my phone rings nonstop. I'll miss 35 phone calls while he's talking about shit I can't even remember just because he likes to talk. So that's my secret. If I ever hang up on you in mid-sentence and it goes dead, I probably actually did hang up on you and put it on airplane mode. <laughs> Phil, it looks like your son enjoyed that story. <laughs> he can't hear it. That's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, I uh, know. Yeah, uh, but um, <clears throat> what else, man? I mean, I guess we, uh, for, you know, for, for the weekend and, and, and stuff coming up, I don't know. What? Aaron, you're you're uh, you said you so you're going to Botech for a uh, seminar. Is that just kind of a uh, prep for those guys for their season? Is uh, it? I don't know. How I got roped into that shit. Uh, <laughs> Jason Phelps asked me to do it, and I like Phelps, so I'm like, yeah, I'll go. And so I think I'm going to do it a little bit differently. Normally, I I kind of I give the seminar and wait to questions at the end and then I I don't hardly get any questions and then I just get pms and texts and emails and shit with all these questions so this time I'm probably not going to talk and just they ask me questions because uh oh. season's starting and I mean that way I can just answer some questions guys have because I might not on a seminar maybe I don't touch on footwear as much as somebody might want me to so at least it's more direct but right after that I go in for um I mean, basically 14 days for uh, mule deer and elk. And then I come back and I fly out the uh, September 11th to Washington to uh, take the governor's tag holder for Mountain Goat out. And uh, same guy that uh, has that tag has the governor's elk tag. So I may try and go with him. And then I'm going to come back here and hunt a little bit. And then uh, my buddy Ryan, his wife, Tanya, she drew some crazy tag in uh, – 
in Idaho where I guess you don't shoot anything under 370. So I'm going to go out there and help them with that mostly because they've never seen a 370 bull. So I can actually say, yes, shoot that one. And then to be the pack bitch, uh, cause Ryan's fat <laughs> and I don't think he wants to carry it out. So that's the, the first part of my season anyway. So how many, Phil, are you keeping account of how many people Aaron's hoping doesn't listen to this podcast? <laughs> Ryan's used to that. He's fine. He's fine with that. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's the seminar? in? is it just one-liners in the backcountry, how to tell your best joke sort of thing? <laughs> no, those come naturally. It's just uh, it's easier when you're back there because it's only unless somebody's recording and I say something too stupid. It's just it's just that group, right? No one else hears it. I do that shit in a seminar. That's not good, right? I got to watch the f bomb. I mean, because an f bomb's like a comma for me, right? So I got to be really careful with that. <laughs> I'm with um, yeah well the first podcast i did with you i'm like okay don't cuss be presentable and then you played that song and i'm like throw all that shit out the window that i was worried <laughs> about i'm gonna be okay as fast as you can motherfucker <laughs> <laughs> but uh but phelps has given a uh, seminar on elk calling and then i'm just gonna do one really on backpack hunting but probably mostly just answer questions on whatever guys have on gear and, and backpack hunting adjusting your pack whatever whatever questions they have. Is it, is it just being held at Bowtech or is it for Bowtech? It's just being held at Bowtech at their, uh, at their pro shop. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. So what's uh, new in the world of Kafaru? What do you guys got going on? I mean, other, you do have a job other than helping people hunt. Yeah, no, I've got a job. I, uh, well, the frames, please Lord, we'll be here Wednesday from all the, from the sewers. Cause we're way behind on those. That was, that was a small crisis on the top of the mountain. I had to make some serious phone calls with Phil because people were flipping out, bitching about us on rock slide and some other forums. But anyway, that's going on. And then we've got a few things, um, you know, in the works as far as for, for growth, but nothing, uh, I mean, nothing crazy. Just there's something always in the hopper. So we're always working on He likes that too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he likes the packs. Likes the Kafaru products. Yeah. <laughs> Phil yeah, no. gave a ringing endorsement about Kafaru packs. The the thing with Kafaru is we've um the 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 rate we've we've grown at is hard to keep the wheels on and still keep um everyone from hating each other internally, which is not hating each other, but man, when it's that busy, it's hard for everybody to get along all the time, and then. uh you know, I'm gone a frequent time. <laughs> he likes testing gear, too, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> Loves gear testing, likes you being gone. <laughs> I, yeah, oh, yeah. The, yeah. the thing with Kafaru, like, people ask me, you know, how I got going and how I got in the industry and how I ended up with Kafaru. Most, you know, if there's, like, one product that you use, you're like, where the hell's this been my entire life? Like, the first time that really happened, beyond a doubt, was when I tried a Kafaru back. <laughs> And then it just kind of stayed. I just stuck around, and they hired me. So, so that's that is a good question because people I see a lot of times will ask, uh, "How how do you get started in the industry? How do you make it in the hunting industry? What what would your words of wisdom be, the Aaron Snyder approach to getting in the industry?" Uh, man, that's a tough one because uh, mine was luck and some hard work. But I I would I mean. Be prepared to not make much money. I'm in a position where I make decent money, but I think most guys, once they find out what you do make in a lot of different positions in the outdoor industry, if you can survive off 40, 50 grand, you'll be good. But like, if you think you're going to make a living on doing an outdoor writing, no, not going to happen unless you live in a cardboard box and take a rickshaw back and forth to work. That shit ain't happening. Um, it's uh, it's difficult. So anyway, I don't have any worry. I, you know, words of advice as far as that, other than just work your butt off and, you know, don't give up. The one thing I, I would say is, because I get asked about being on, you know, what do I do to get on the Kafaru pro staff or how do you get on a pro staff? You and, have a pro staff? No. Um, I think so. I mean, we have guys, like I gave Phil his pack. I mean, I we, get, we give guys some packs, you know what I mean? And we give discounts to guys that are, you know, the, the biggest issue, I don't want to say issue, if somebody calls me and says, man, I love your product, we want you to sponsor us, and then I ask them three questions about the product, and it's blatantly obvious they've never used the product, they just want some free shit, that's a problem. We, we like the 
person to be familiar with or know the product and believe in the product before we, um, how would I, without getting myself in any more trouble. No, go for it. Go for it. Oh, I'm sure. Well, no, there's some uh, feelings get hurt, man. And I'm, I don't want to, I fuck their feelings. Yeah. Well, yeah, you only need six, right? You need only six friends. You got to have pole bears, right? That's right. if, (laughs) If someone says in packs that, um, you know, you've got Kafaru, then, you know, Kafaru being, let's say, brand A, B, and C. And B and C are fairly known pieces of shits. And, but you've got a bunch of people promoting B and C. But then those guys from B and C occasionally call me and they're like, man, if you give me this, I'll happily talk about your product, but you're going to have to give me this much stuff. Immediately, your ass will never be sponsored by me ever in the history of time from the beginning to the end of it because you are a hired gun. We want guys to use our products. They like it, not because I gave you enough shit to talk about it. Um, Phil, and, Phil and you, don't send him our wish list. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, like, it's not that. It's just that uh, you see a lot on Facebook. In fact, Phil and I talked about, about a few different guys that – so, and I, I mean, by all means, I, I, you guys see how much gear I go through. I test everything, but I think the muffler should be at least cooled down on the UPS truck before I start hashtagging the shit out of that product. Best in the world, bomb proof. I hate those terms because he probably set it up his front yard anyway. So how do you know if it's bomb proof? And he hasn't really tested it, but it's brand new. But anyway, the whole pro staff, I think, as far as like getting on one, in most cases, I'm going to seek you out before you seek me out. If you're if you're a guy that's used our product and you're promoting it well, I'm going to come find you. I'm going to send you a PM or say, hey, dude, let's get a relationship type of a thing going on. You, you're a great ambassador for Kafaru. Um, and, then, you know, there's a fine line in there. Some of the guys, like, that have a pretty good social media following but um, may give some bad advice on gear. There's kind of a, a – I'm kind of talking – it's hard to explain without getting myself in trouble. I would just say promote the product you believe in, not the one you get for free is a cool thing. And then actually test the product before you promote the product. And I, when I say test it, don't go walk around your living room or your front yard or the local whatever. Just, uh, you know, put some good solid use in it because if you, if, you, uh, if you post a review of a certain piece of product – and then guys start coming after you with questions, and you have to PM me to answer those questions. You probably haven't used the product enough to write a review on it. And that kind of stuff happens a lot. Um, the whole pro staff thing, that type of stuff happens a lot, I found out uh, in this day and age. And I think one thing people get confused of, too, is there's, there's really two separate pro staffs. There's promotions staff, which... Most people who say they're pro staff are a promotion staff, you know, yeah. say, you know, they show it to pro, but it, it really stands for promotions. These are the guys who might get discounts on bows and shit and they have to go work shows and things of that nature. And then there's guys who may be either making a living, writing reviews or, or their opinions are so entrusted that companies will send them products to test. And that would be more of the real pro staff, the more legit side of it. Yeah. And this would be my advice from not, and I don't have a, a terrible amount of experience, but I've kind of been on both sides of that coin. And it's this, it's figure out something you really, really like to do and you do it differently than everyone else and keep doing that. And like you said, be willing to make no money and do it for free and don't fuck around and go to a million different companies asking for shit. Yeah, the the loyalty thing goes a long way because I feel like there's it, not a lot of loyalty in this. <clears throat> no, there isn't. There isn't. It 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 may take somebody years to get some notoriety or recognition to where they they get they start getting uh, recognized on that level of um, being you know what would be the professional staff, not the promotional staff category. And you know sometimes you got to grind it out and keep doing that. Um, but either way, I mean, that, that whole topic is, I, I get a little bit, I, I get it from the, from the, from the pro shop side, 
because people, you know, will come to me kind of like they're coming to Aaron looking for gear. You know, they want th discounts. They want free stuff. You know, I've been on on the flip side of where when I was tournament shooting a lot, well, yeah, you, you need a little help with some products and, you know, a few things here and there because it's expensive to go shoot tournaments all over the place, you know, just like it's expensive to go hunting all over the place. So I see it from both sides, but, but I agree with Aaron. It's one of those deals that you you learn to filter through a lot of the garbage pretty quickly after you've seen it because you've lived it and you, you, you know what you know where you're at you know what you know what where other people are at you know if they're just really looking for a for a deal or, or like you said if they're just the ones that no loyalty and they just uh they'll go with whatever product wants to give them a few you know a few little bit of recognition or a couple free pieces of merchandise and, and here's the thing to that too when you talk about the shooting end or the the tournament shooters and that is if if that's the route you're going to go, you better be willing to work your balls off and invest a lot in yourself before anyone's going to give you anything. Yeah. And that, that's the the working part I have noticed uh, uh, is people may have trouble with it. And and a guy can – there's a few guys that, you know, hashtag on, on Instagram, Kefaru and Facebook, and they're great dudes, but they don't have maybe a spear of influence. They don't have that – they don't have a big enough following. They're, they're working their butt off to promote Kafaru, but they don't have a huge following, and they will eventually. Um, and I feel bad that I have to say, no, I can't, guys, I can't give everyone free shit and discounts, right? I mean, like, if you have 23 likes on your Instagram post and, you know, Phil talks about, you know, he went over and blew his nose and he has 400 likes on that, he's got a sphere of influence. And, I mean, people get a little bit confused, too, like, because uh, – uh, you know, I've been criticized some for using a bunch of different products, and I think because the the industry is so locked up on if you – if I talk about an MSR stove today that it's a solid product, and then in a week I'm talking about a Primus stove, and it's a solid product, that doesn't mean I jump ship. That just means I'm testing it out so you guys don't buy shitty gear. That just means I'm testing them, and they're both solid products. Now, obviously with Kafaru, I work for Kafaru, but like – if uh, well, Gillingham is a good example. Gillingham uses more releases than I've worn underwear in my entire life, right? What do you think he's probably used fifty uh, in the last? Like, yeah, he'll he'll ch thought, change two or three into a series of a tournament. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and and Gillingham, it's not like I get pissed if he says buy this. This is a solid product, and that he's used in something in two weeks. It's just that is a solid product. He's just decided to change, and so. There are certain guys that are going to lock up with the company, and they're going to have, like, Sitka, they're going to promote them, and they're going to promote Mystery Ranch, and they're going to promote Hilleberg and, and Leica. That, that's kind of a click right there, those those four companies. And then there's guys probably with Kefaro. They're going to promote Kefaro, Vortex, or Swarovski, you know, then our shelters, and then First Light or Cryptic, right? That's another click where me, you know, I, I don't wear Kuyu, but I wear Sitka, First Light, Cryptic, Kafaru Packs. I test out Hilleberg, Black Diamond. You know, you name it, I'm trying it all. Well, that's not because I'm a ship jumper, but all those people that I deal with, if I talk about their product, they know they're going to sell that product because I'm talking about it because it's not a piece of crap. Where you could take another guy that he has, he talks about four or five products. He's only talking about those because he got them for free, and they could be crappy, if that makes any sense, where I only talk about them when I know my name's on it, and it's going to be a decent product for guys or, or whatever the case may be. And I think uh, in a lot of cases this day and age, they may not even be looking for a discount. They want to be able to just wrap their name around the title pro staff, and it makes them feel kind of warm and fuzzy where – I'm at a point like I hate the word pro staff and it drives me crazy. And Phil talked and I talked a lot about this on the side of the mountain, but Phil, it's not that glorious. Get, Phil, get rid of the paperwork to offer Aaron the first natural born hunter pro staff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, Lord. Yeah. It was wow. going to be huge. <laughs> I think uh, my wife's laughing at me. Um, I think that people need to realize that all the companies they're dealing with are in – they're in business to make money. That's how life works. And if you're not making a company money by what you're providing them, then it was a bad investment. And I'm speaking for Kfaru. Um, you can be the biggest heavy hitter in the world that drops more shit than smallpox. 
the way this day and age, if you don't have a Facebook social media presence, you're not a guide and outfitter, you're not talking to people, you may have earned that free product, but you're not selling any product. And that's what it's all about is selling products. So you need to be able to, um, if someone sends me something for free and I like it, they've at least earned me writing a review, talking about it on forums, things like that. Otherwise, why would they give it to me? Because I, you know, I've got a super cool curved brim. I don't, I mean, I need to make it worth their while for them to send me something. Yeah, yeah and that, and get a lot more interest if you had a flat brim, I think. A lot more face <laughs> likes. Oh, I definitely get a lot more interest. Look at that fucking idiot with the flat brim. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's just because it's, it's just cause my head. It's nothing to do with your. <laughs> hey, I know it's not. You're talking about this. This product right here has been tested, improven to improve archery skills, and pretty much every other facet of your life. Well, let me ask you a question, Will. Do you have your ears tucked into your hat? I'm gonna tell you right this. I'm gonna tell you this. Fucking out. I see another motherfucker on one of these hunting videos, and they don't have their ears tucked into their hats, and they're wearing a big flat brim. You look like a fucking idiot. You you so tuck the ears in. Don't you don't hear? You don't curve them down like this. This look like I can't even get it that far down. My ears are very well. big, but you don't let it do this. You don't do this. No no no. This is how you wear a nice a nice flat brim. You're not gonna see you know well, easy and I, I boy. just went down. Look at that. That shit doesn't look right on my it's head. Fucking well. head right now, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> that's how hey. he does his hats because however the brim comes on my dad's hat that's how it stays forever there's no, no curve in the brim the way you fix that you don't wear a flat brim hat that's that's how you fix it yeah <laughs> fuck that <laughs> you want to look cool hey man that's I, what he's saying don't wear a flat brim I grew I'm up, not kids Phil you don't care what you look like anymore right I grew up playing baseball right since I was a kid I played a couple years juco ball and People were just starting to wear the flat brim around that time frame. It was the coolest shit when you had the coolest fucking bend in your hat to where that's how you wore a hat, to where you can barely see your eyes. I mean, that's that's how we wore it back in the day. And I have a hard time right now because my son's got a couple hats that are flat brim, and I have a hard time not taking the freaking rubber bands in a, in a, a pop can or something else to that freaking hat. But I'm going to let him be for a little while. But I don't know, man. The, the ears tucked into the hat, the flat brim. No, it's just not do. my style, that's man. It's do. just not my style. Hey, that's why I'm we're that's why we're a show that reaches everybody. Whether you <laughs> you you curve well, you're reaching some special people. Yeah, what you, <laughs> you curve and Zach Griffiths. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Strong. <laughs> <laughs> and I have nothing against Zach. Before I get some hateful emails from Zach Griffith, Lay Bombers, but we we and I've given each other shit about the flat brim, but uh. If you wear your hat like that where I'm from, you get your ass beat by with by loggers, right? You don't you just don't wear flat brims from Oregon where I'm from for my time frame. Now there's a bunch of flat brimmers hooked on mess. I it's different. But so when I was there, telling me that if you wear a flat brim hat, it's just a matter of time before you're a meth addict. <laughs> no, no. Homosexual, maybe, but not meth. There's nothing to correlate flat brims and you know, meth, but homosexuality. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's the option. What's the kid thing? Have. Bieber? Bieber? Doesn't Bieber wear flat brims? I don't know what the fuck he wears. How, how would you? Do you even know? I, so, I got a funny no. girl, man. Uh, don't tell I'm, me fairly, I'm fairly certain she's got a picture of Bieber with a flat brim. <laughs> and even she says she's a homosexual. And my daughter's only 14. She likes everybody. He's Canadian, though. Hey, Andy. No, nothing against Andy Fuller. Who I know is listening to this. <laughs> nothing against Andy. <laughs> What's the deal with? Okay, so you know, flat brims. Okay, I get it, right? I mean, it's not my style, but no, then the tight jeans. I seen a dude today wearing tight shorts that were rolled up above his knees, like skin tight. Oh shit! What the that. hell is that? That's you're on that track, Will. You got the flat brim. <laughs> No, I passed. Fuck that. I went past. I got my own thing going. I'm going to show you this right now, Aaron. I'm going to explain Lycra? what's going on with this hat. This is not going to always be a, a flat brim. To the to the not unknowing, untrained eye, as you know, yours and Phil's, what you don't realize is there's a slight downward curvature right here going on. It's more of a saucer shape, if you will, I'm trying to get adjusted into this hat. But as it's new, it's going to take me some time. And instead of skinny jeans, I've gone straight to tights. Oh, that's awesome. On that note, I, just said I got a 
I got to take a potty break. <laughs> Wait one. I've been trying to rehydrate, right? You don't piss for six hours. You kind of overdo it later on when you get back. I'll be back. <laughs> yeah, I'm just, I'll just, you know what? This is perfect time for Mountain this Ops. Sponsored by Mountain Ops. You got it, Phil. Let's hear it <laughs> straight from the horse's mouth. A man who has tried it in the field on one of the toughest hunts of his entire fucking life. How did Mountain Ops, because I know you were trying it out there, how did it work for you? I'll I tell you that, you know, when you're up there, um, you, you really pay attention to how much water you're drinking, like Eric said. There's a couple times where because we couldn't get to water, you're really restricted. So that's where supplementing your, your hydration with, you know, like in, Enduro, for example, that's, you know, what I was popping what is, in my what's water. Enduro? Yeah. I know what it is, but people out there, what, what's Enduro? Uh, as far as, uh, you, you're talking about like the, 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 the break on the components. I'm not going to have you rip the formula off here for well, me. Yeah. I mean, so it's, it's your, it's your, your supplementation for your hydration with, um, and I, I'm not going to go into all the, the products, right. But you, you're basically, you're, you're supplementing your, your, your hydration, your water by, um, and, and and again, will the, the the components? You, it's it's more your. Uh, um, I'm 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 lo- I'm losing my train of thought here. You're killing it! You are flat out killing. <laughs> hey, in, the enduros, the, the real. What's that? <laughs> Just tell us what it did for you. How about that? It, it, if you're drinking water alone, it's not enough. You you have to supplement the water with your. Um, God, you know what? I'm gonna have to. I can go back and and uh, um, take a couple shots of uh, tequila here after uh, after my my hiatus in the mountains. But <laughs> I, I was actually feeling like such such just ugh, just drained. I actually did a little bit of the uh, Yeti at the beginning of this podcast, and right now I'm fucking jacked out of my mind. <laughs> I probably should have only done a half scoop. Right now, I honestly feel like I'm about to bench press this desk. I'm I'm out of Yeti. I need to get some more, so I need to I need to probably take some of that to to wake up. But um, did I miss anything? Workout. What did I miss? I, I'm trying to explain to Will <laughs> how my enduro supplemented my my uh, <laughs> phenomenal job describing what enduro is. The hydration <laughs> with, with hiking in the mountains, but uh, I'm, I'm going to take a pee break. Maybe Eric. Can help you tell talk a little bit about Mountain Ops and Enduro as this as we keep this commercial Mountain Ops crashing directly into the ground and setting everything <laughs> on fire. <laughs> like I <laughs> Aaron, you just take, take it. Step. You just take it. Yeah, yeah, it's good. It's fine. I'm not a chemist, Will. <laughs> here, hold here, I'll grab give me I'll let me grab some Mountain Ops Enduro. I got it right beside me here. I'm loaded up. We're ready to go. So I was trying to explain to Will that on on I was mixing enduro with the water, right? Yeah. Uh, that that's what I was was taking, and it I mean it, in a nutshell it just it, it helps with increased with with the hydration. I mean it's you yes. got your I mean you got your your uh, was it vitamin and C B. Yeah. Well, vitamin C and vitamin, there's three vitamin Bs and one of them's bad and two of them are good. But yeah, like basically it has uh, like electrolytes, which electrolytes, yeah, yeah, that fires, helps the electrolytes fire the synapses to the brain. And uh, more or less like when, Mm -hmm. what happens if you do not, if you're dehydrated, if you're just pissing out sweat like crazy and you just drink water without electrolytes in it you're actually somewhat making not everything but some things worse because you're flushing what nutrients you have in your system out and i'm not a doctor but what you need is electrolytes to refuel your body so water alone is is okay but you need you you know all your different vitamins and minerals your electrolytes to replenish your body and enduro has those that's what i was that's the word that was escaping when i was trying to explain to will electrolytes electrolytes thank you um, I'm not. I'm not a complete idiot, Will. But uh, <laughs> sugar-free Gatorade. Well, that. yeah. I mean, it, essentially, 
Yes. There's electrolytes. Well, there's arginine in there as well and some other stuff. But Which helps this, blood flow for those who don't know. I think arginine is a vasodilator, correct? Vascular dilator, that's correct. Yep. Yep. Which uh, helps uh, pump blood through your veins. Gives you that, uh, if you ever heard Arnold Schwarzenegger talk on uh, pumping iron, talks about the pump, that arginine will help you with that pump. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm fucking jacked out of my mind right now. Maybe I should take a little less of the Yeti. Holy <laughs> shit. Well, the Yeti, the thing that I don't take Yeti too much or not consistently in the backcountry, because um, there, there's creatine or creatine in it, which most people don't seem to understand what creatine does. It superhydrates your muscles, but it also makes you shit harder than a diamond because it dries your system out. And if you're already dehydrated and you're not taking in enough water, you don't want to take Yeti on a really consistent basis in the backcountry. Taking it every now and then is fine, but... When I say in the backcountry, if you're able to hydrate yourself just fine, drink up, sniff it, whatever you want to do. But if you're dehydrated like we were, don't be drinking Yeti 24-7 like don't three times it, a Will. day. Don't sniff yeah, it, Will. Definitely. <laughs> I, I sniff it. You're not going to have a, po- a co-host for this podcast anymore because I'm going to be arrested for losing my mind out there. Yeah. Well, and I chew, obviously, Copenhagen, and that doesn't help the dehydration either. But, um, you know but what yeah, we were a new habit what? helped me perform cigar smoking. Oh, did it? Yeah. Well, no, That's it's more good. for victories, but yeah, I think it's enhancing everything I do. <laughs> I'd recommend it for any of you out there training. It'll expand well, things if you're in the back uh, country. I think I picked that up off Aspen Extreme. <laughs> I, uh, I started chewing because we were on patrol and I was falling asleep and someone was like, hey, chew, and then you'll choke on your spit when you fall asleep. So between that and putting Tabasco sauce under my eyes and then coffee grounds under my tongue, one of those three is going to keep you awake. Well, that was in 1994 or five, and here I am still chewing today. I could have paid for an eighty thousand dollar, you know, truck cash with what I spent and chew. And I chew a lot, and I mean, it's not like it's a good thing, but I mean, we backpacked in there. I had a can for each day. I chew about a can a day, and um, I don't know what would happen. If I didn't have chew, but I can't imagine it would be a good thing because I turn into a royal dickhead. Now you just need some Yeti. You just pack that in your lip. <laughs> Why sniff that? I'll sniff it between the lip. Take it up your yeah, ass. Yeah, yeah, I went into I went into the spirit world when Phil was sleeping. That's why he got the sheep. I ate one of those mushrooms, sniffed some Yeti, <laughs> and then I took my super tarp and wrapped it around me like a loincloth, <laughs> and then started howling at the moon. And that shit worked. I'm gonna do it again. So, so what we got? From Aaron Snyder, one of the best hunters in the world, is the key to success. Wearing your tarp around like a loincloth, eating, eating uh, psychedelic mushrooms, and sniffing Yeti. Yeah, that's funny. Exactly. Words of wisdom. And I said, you know, would you say, like, I would like the best hunter in the world thing? I tell you, I um, – I'm starting the rumor. Yeah, don't start that because I'll get shit from the haters. I think for me, like the – what people – People have a hard time wrapping their head around because, you know, I like helping guys and I like taking photos. Now, I like to kill shit, too, but I that definitely think like a gay porn ad. Hell, yeah. You <laughs> stole my idea. <laughs> um, Phil, but I, uh, the next time he asks you. <laughs> write that down. I, uh, I mean, the one thing, like on do-it-yourself hunts, I, I, I definitely have a good track record. It's not very often where we go and we, we don't kill anything, but... There's the whole thing, and Brian and I have talked about it. In fact, you guys should do a podcast with Brian on the kind of the trophy places versus trophy animals, trophy hunting. And for me, it's the areas I go and the fun that I have. And and, uh, we're definitely not taking trophy animals. We're just, we're always taking animals out of there, but they're not always giant ones. And I've passed up a lot of opportunities on private land. Not because I don't want to go shoot a big bull, but something about getting the shit kicked out of me on a backcountry hunt just. I, I like that, and that's kind of my thing. So, I mean, I I totally understand that. I'm not the best hunter in the world like you are. However, you know, back when I was a single man, I didn't do too bad for myself. And hey, it wasn't trophies trophies I was taking out of there, but I could take something out of there almost every night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Now, where are you at, New York? Uh, you know where Utica is. Do you have a soul, by the way? I you're Me? a ginger. No, fuck yeah. that. That's a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> I traded it for rollerblades back in the early 90s. My buddy Ryan Avery told me gingers have no soul. No, I, didn't know, 
No, that's bad. I'm only half ginger, so I got I got like a little bit of one. My hair goes from brown to orange depending on the season. That's cool. Like a is that a gecko chameleon? Yeah, like a chameleon. <laughs> I don't know, like some kind of reptile. But but, I tell you what, though, I was stationed in northern New York, and if I li- if I if I owned northern New York in hell. I'd rent northern New York out part time. That fucking gets cold <laughs> as shit. I remember snowshoeing to the chow hall, man. That shit ain't right. Yeah. We it had uh, a- just south of where you would have been stationed at Fort Drum. They had the largest amount of snowfall this year. We watched Braveheart, right? Yeah. Braveheart came out. We got it. We turned Braveheart on. There wasn't snow on the ground. And then when Braveheart got over, we went to turn it in, and the fucking car was covered up in snow. You could just see the antenna sticking out. <laughs> oh, and it's it, heavy that snow, lake, too. That lake effect? That lake of, yeah, lake effect. like the western snow. It's like, I forget what they say, like 60% wetter or something. A lot more water I, content in it. I don't know, but we got deployed to Panama in February, and it was like <laughs> negative 18. And we got to Panama. It was like 98 with 98% humidity. I thought I was going to die. It was bad. Like, I got prickly heat. Have you guys ever got that? Oh. Well, you should both get it just so you say you had it because it's great. Sounds good. It's where sweat dries in your pores and dirt and crystallizes, and it's like thousands of knives, needles stabbing you. Well, I didn't know if I had some kind because you go through this stupid class and they show you this flea that stings you, and you're, you get elephantitis and your nuts drop, and then there's these caimans and black palm and all this different shit and all these 50 cal ants, these big ants. And could have been had, a aerial disease, anything. It could have been. I. You never know. But I, uh, you know, like I was a practical joker in the military, too. So I took my MRE crackers because they have these Akuta Mondays. They're like uh, they're kind of like raccoons. And then they have howling monkeys. But anyway, I would sprinkle crackers when we were on patrol when everybody was racked out. And then these Akuta Mondays would be sitting on guys' chests eating the crackers and they'd wake up and flip out. Now, I didn't tell anybody I did that, but those fuckers got me back. As Phil knows, I can't – spicy food's not for me. And so we all get in the Chinook, and you don't want to spit on – there in the Blackhawk, and you don't want to spit on the floor. And those assholes filled my canteen up with Tabasco sauce. Oh. And I took a big swig of that. Oh, Christ almighty. I shit through a window screen for like a week. <laughs> <laughs> it was bad. But uh, anyway, I don't know why the hell I'm talking about that. But, yeah, don't get prickly heat. Um, but yeah, I was yeah, that's, the lesson, that's the lesson from the story. Don't get prickly heat. Maybe don't and put don't, some crackers on your buddy. So that you get fucking flaming diarrhea. Yeah, <laughs> yeah don't go to Panama. Start. Don't go to Panama. Yeah. There you go. Oh, well, like we got to Panama, right? We went into, they dropped us off in Panama City. And, uh, there's like four story whorehouses there, right? And like there's this guy with no teeth. When we get off the bus, go doing this, follow me. And I'm like, and I'm from Oregon, like I was unworldly. I'd never been in a big city. I'd hardly flown. And I'm like, Aaron's cool. thinking I ain't paying more than 20 bucks for you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, I'm like, you know, farm boy type, you know, logger kid, like, oh my Lord, where, what did I happen? Because I was super young. I mean, I think I was, I was probably 18 at the time. But um, yeah, they, clo- they closed Fort Clayton down which is where the jungle operation training center was in like, uh, 97, I guess. So you can see I'm old, but, um, yeah, it was an interesting thing for a kid from Oregon to go down there. But, uh, either way, so, the, so, uh, wait, 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 whoa, whoa. rewind, rewind. So you were following the man with no, no teeth to the fourth, fourth story. Well, it was, house. Is this when you peeled off and said, sorry, I've got religious class. I got to get to. No, but we went there, and there, it was like – so it was four stories, and the bottom was like this uh, – This, it was crazy. <laughs> it's there like chicks spinning on the seats, and I, it was insane. Like I'm sitting there like watching it like, wow, I've read about this shit in books before. This is crazy, right? <laughs> but uh, anyway, <laughs> yeah, but no, I was good. I didn't do anything stupid, but uh, I didn't want to get the gift that keeps on giving, right? Like – you don't really want to mess around with that shit in South America. It's not a good idea. Wink, wink. Yeah, we all walked away that day. <laughs> oh, no. We all didn't know. But, I, I mean, I think the guys that were young were scared to death. Like, we all ran back scared. Like, oh, my God, we're going to get syphilis or something. But that was like our day of freedom when the whatever three months I was in Panama. And then uh, shortly after that, we flew back to the great state of New York where it was snowing again and Freezing to death. 
that you missed that Panamanian whorehouse right there. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Yeah, well, New York's a special place because you're you're up north too, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. I'm just below the. Uh, I'm like ten miles from or less from the Adirondack Park, the entrance. And actually, you bring up logging. Next Sunday, I'm gonna go to the Woodsman's Field Days, which is up in Boonville, New York. And watch the uh, New York State Open Lumberjacking Championship. Mm-hmm. Excited to go see that. See the, I think it's the springboard they got, the grease pole climb maybe. Overhand uh, shot, yep. single and double. Yeah, I, I used to enter those, believe it or not. How'd you do? Good. Well, <laughs> it's different nowadays when you're a kid, right? I was running a chainsaw at 10 years old. Like, for those of you from Oregon, I'm from Detroit Lake. It's like 250 people. And through the summers, my job was a trail crew team where you hike the wilderness trails 10 miles a day and cut logs out of the way with a crosscut saw. So there's no chainsaw or an axe. So I had done that and, uh, you know, manual labor, 14 to 15 years old, all summer long to afford school clothes. So I was running a crosscut saw uh, where now manual labor, people think it's the prime minister of Panama. You know, I actually had to work for school clothes because we were poor as shit. So I was running a chainsaw when I was 10 years old cutting firewood. We only had wood stove, right? We only had wood heating. And I tell you, the day I left for the Army, my parents brought a fucking pellet stove. <laughs> so <laughs> the more I, they didn't have me get into trouble getting any more firewood. So yeah, they I, bought a pellet stove. I had a similar, similar thing, only I was doing construction to afford school clothes. Yeah, yeah. Well, you do what you got to do. You don't want to be the kid that gets made fun of from wearing old shit. No, that's why people will hire kids these days who want to start at the top because that's, that's my main job is construction. And it's like, dude, I've fucking I've sift, I've sifted dog shit out of places before. I've done things <laughs> you wouldn't fucking ever want to do. And I, I'd never make anyone do anything I wouldn't do. Right. And they start out and, and we had one kid quit because I made him sweep a floor. It's like, no. kid, I started pushing that broom around, and I pushed it for years. Like, you're yeah. quitting because you're too good to push a broom around? Fuck, we don't need you. Do you now, do you run a uh, – are you a general contractor, or do you own yep. your own construction company? Yeah, family company, GC. I'm usually uh, – I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily say we have a foreman because everybody kind of works as a team, and everyone, you know, really uh, knows how to do their own job without being told. So, you know, I don't have to tell anyone really what to do, but – uh, you know, we just finished a pretty about a month long of laying down pieces of bluestone around a uh, pool patio, and let me tell you. So you do residential more than commercial. Yep. Yeah, yeah, like commercial, we've we've built some vet clinics, redone some uh, like what are they what would they be called out there? Like uh, like a Seven Eleven type stores, things like that. That's about yeah. the most commercial we get. Yeah, no, I did residential and commercial glass, mostly commercial for a long time, um, high rises. In fact, uh, Phil knows Jeremy Troxel, Wolfman. Um, Jeremy's tougher than woodpecker lips, right? Kid has testicular cancer, gets his nut cut off. He's still completing in Mountain Warrior training camp, and he's like, it's not that bad, dude. I'm a lot more nimble now. And he shifts to the left. He's like, see? See how quick that was? It's because my nut's gone. <laughs> he's just, kid's tougher than hell, but he was my apprentice for a few years and then i ended up being like the, the gm of the glass company but um he was there through the whole steroid days like he had to work with me every day when i was all jacked up on mountain dew hanging guys out of a building and throwing guys out the front door it was as you can imagine like give you an example of like because my brain didn't work correctly wait I'm, so are you I'm, taking steroids or you just call them the steroids days oh no i took them like you never seen a photo of me or anything when i was on that no, we're going to have to get one of those to put up with the show. Phil, you, you've seen me on that oh, shit, yeah. haven't you, Phil? Yeah. I got up to 270. I bench pressed 540 oh. at one time. Oh, uh, big boy. Well, I had like this goal to hit 270, and I got it. But I was on enough shit to kill a donkey, right? Like it was bad. And, and Jeremy had to work with me every day, right? And so, for example, they wanted we were doing this huge, uh, basically, complex down by the uh, – Red Rocks Community College, whatever, right, Aurora Campus. Anyway, they're like, hey, you need to get this doorway in in the GC meeting. And I'm like, well, there's scaffolding in the way, and the door swings out. You can't swing that shit unless you move the scaffolding. And it had an overhead concealed Rickson um, closure. Anyway, so me being me, we go out there, and there's people on the scaffolding, and they're like, you don't get that door, and today you're getting back charged. So I just walked out, 
grabbed all three stages of scaffolding and flipped that shit over with people on it, tools on it, flying off Jeremy's like, oh, I don't know. That was a good idea, Aaron, because like three stages of scaffolding, I just flipped it over. We started putting the door in. Of course, that caused a little bit of a scuffle with the guys putting the stucco up. But that was <laughs> like the mentality I had when I was on that stuff. Your brain doesn't work correctly. So when you're relaxed, Aaron that. Snyder, we have now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I handled it pretty well compared to to some, but um, I mean, I like I uh, if pull up a photo on my phone. I went from about two twenty to two sixty in about eight months, and there was like there wasn't much I couldn't do, couldn't lift. I mean, I uh, you know like incline bench with dumbbells with 180 180 pound dumbbells with no spotter i mean there's a reason that shit's illegal <laughs> it's bad but i i didn't stay on it for too terribly long it's and uh, is there a hell of a drug well i try to like i speak like people like i can't believe you talk about that it was the worst decision i ever made i mean nothing good came out of it um luckily i didn't have any long-term uh, effects for I mean when the microwave comes on I piss my pants but that shit will buff out so your balls Let's didn't see. shrink or nothing then yeah they did man they're the size of nickels they could they grow back <laughs> <but> there's <laughs> no way if you're on that they're going away they're not they're gone right ah that um this hey, is Will one, but... Will after you have kids man um at this point they're just dead weight so <laughs> let's see can you see that? Holy fuck! <laughs> you look like the thing. Yeah. <laughs> the, thing. The, the rock on Fantastic Four. Oh, yeah. I got, I, I got big. Um, let's see. Good lord. Yeah, there's an... What? The, you don't so, even look like you. I know, right? I was strong though. I, uh, <laughs> but I tell you what. Strong is stupid. Gotta... Those are two dangerous combinations. <laughs> Well, I took Trinibolin for a while, and I tell you what, Trin is not shit to work with when you got a bad temper to begin with. And so, like, it gives you superhuman everything, aggression, sex, drive, strength. You're just a monster, right? Some guys like that. No. I hung a guy out of a four-story building by his fucking feet, right? Who does that? Well, this guy shit in a bucket, right? <laughs> I've, had he was on my trip. I've had that happen, actually. And I went over there. I was like, you lazy. And, you know, we started going at it. And I'm like, you know, and I fired him. He's like, you can't fire me. And I'm like, dude, you're going to go down, get your shit. And you're going out of here. And you're going to go slow way down the stairs or the fast way out the side of the window if you don't get out of here now. So I hung him out the building by his feet. Looking back, probably not the most intelligent thing I ever did in life, right? Like, you know, you can go to jail for that. But once I got, I mean, it took about six months for me to get my shit back together again once I got off that stuff. But that's why I see <laughs> some guys promote how natural they're natural. And I took enough of that shit. I could tell, like, you know, potheads can, you know, they immediately, oh, that guy's a pothead and they know. Well, you take enough steroids, you figure out who's on it and who's not. And, and uh, I definitely can pick it up fairly quick because I was in the, you know, I did powerlifting and bodybuilding for a while. So what what was the defining moment that was, was it hanging the guy out with the feet or was the nut shrinkage? Oh, that, hell like, no. I kept doing that uh, shit for another eight months after that. Oh, my, <laughs> your wee wee, my wee wee broke, right? Like it quit working. <laughs> What? The weenus stopped working completely for like three months. That'll make you quit doing anything. So you, you can still piss, correct? Yeah, but that's about all it would do. <laughs> like, oh, fuck. <laughs> I know, right? So what it is is when you take uh, steroids, you, you there's uh, anabolic. You want me to? I guess it doesn't matter. This isn't yeah, the G-rated. Go for it. Um, there's test, and then there's an anabolic, and if you take take 1200 milligrams of test a week which is way too much and that's what i was doing then you want to take five or six hundred milligrams of an anabolic i'm not a doctor this is just what i was told and that's what i did and so if you take an antate which is a, a very hard uh, it's an oil-based test and it's it's 300 milligrams per milliliter so you want to do that every other day and some of the things stay in your body longer than others but then you want to take like deca or Oh, what's another one? Echopoise at the same time. And if you take too much test, you get lethargic. And if you take too much of an anabolic, 
you basically turn into a woman, right? That's how you get bitch tit or gynomastasia is what they call it, but it's where you get bitch tit. And again, I'm not a doctor. I'm sure someone else can explain this better. But I had, uh, <laughs> I had t some comes like if it's 250 grams per milliliter. Other stuff, maybe three or 400 grams per milliliter. Well, me being the dumb shit that I am, I wasn't paying attention. So I was pumping double the amount of anabolic I needed. Okay. And, uh, yeah, which is why I was purple as shit. And I look like a smurf with that photo is I was taking too much of one type. And then, um, you know, like I was watching uh, oh, Hidalgo when the horse falls in the pit and I started crying because <laughs> you're basically all emotional all the time. So it's definitely not a good thing to get. I'm a strong advocate of, against getting on anything like that. And in reality, I've lost it all anyway, and I've tried to lose it because to be a mountain hunter, I've lost every bit of muscle I really had. Like at one time, I had you know, 18 inch arms, 38 inch quads, just a beast. I could do whatever I wanted to at any time. I couldn't walk across the street, but I tell you what, I could lift a lot of shit. But so, uh, so were you an avid? Av were you into mountain mountain hunting then? Because you looked more like a mountain than someone who'd be on one. No, I mean, in fact, Jeremy makes jokes about it. We went shed hunting and. Uh, I thought I was going to die. Like a few times I'm like, dude, we got to stop. He's like, man, we only walked a hundred yards. And I'm like, mm -hmm, I need a break. <laughs> so a lot different than now where I can. And I think that's one of the reasons I can pack the weight now a little bit better than a lot of guys is, um, I used to, you know, I was packing 70 more pounds for quite a while. I, I can't wait to see your transformation Tuesday picture. No, so it's, if you saw, cause I went, I was fat and then I was skinny and then I was like muscle head. And I, I've, I've definitely, the human body, I mean, if you're mentally strong enough, you can do whatever you want to do if you work hard enough at it. Not everyone. I mean, some guys, skinny guys are all, always going to be skinny. But, I mean, you can push your body to limits that, I mean, obviously, I had a lot of help from, you know, steroids. But, I mean, as far as, like, yeah, I, at one time I was doing adventure races and mountain bike racing, 185, 190 pounds. And then I got to where I was entering powerlifting competitions and, uh, you know, like a solid – for powerlifting, the big three, like you've got deadlift, bench press, and squat. Well, if you're in like the 1,500-pound club, you've done something right, and then you hit that 2,000-pound club, you're a monster. Well, I hit the 2,000-pound club just working out in the gym. Like, you know, there's nothing like once you get on that stuff, you get what's called vigorexia when you get off because you don't – like you feel like you're shrinking and you don't want to go to the gym. But, you know, you throw – 405 with no spotter on an incline bench press and start doing sets of eight to 10, it's probably going to turn some heads and then you get addicted to that. So either way, that's probably enough about my steroid days. Let's change subjects. <laughs> yeah. Before this turns into a commercial for them. Yeah. Don't do them. I'm telling you, don't, it's not good. <laughs> not good. You can lift crazy amounts of weights and do whatever the fuck you want. <laughs> Yeah, you can. But, I mean, it was something like now, you know, I'm down to, I don't know what I weighed after Bill's trip of 195, 200 and trying to lose muscle because it sucks up oxygen. So I definitely, it was a pretty piss poor life choice. Stick to mountain ops then. Yeah, stick to mountain ops. I'll tell you what, because I used to fight quite a bit and uh, I uh, I got caught in a, in a pretty good arm bar and uh, I could hear my corner man yelling, pick him up. And so... The guy was 280 pounds. I picked him up. I was nothing and slammed him on his head so he didn't break my arm. Man, they blood tested me after that fight. Man, I like it looked like a rainbow chart, man. There was all kinds of shit in my system. <laughs> <laughs> so I got stuck. I couldn't fight for like six months until uh, everything came clean. Some of that shit I hadn't taken in like eight, nine months. DECA stays in your system for a long time. Holy shit. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah, stip to Yeti and Enduro. It's good for you. <laughs> <laughs> Eat eggs. <laughs> Those butter things about are the Panamanian whorehouses. <laughs> <laughs> he blend in, man. He's brown. I'm shockingly Caucasian, as I said, so I didn't blend in. I will do no undercover work. Phil could go anywhere. I was like, oh, that's a white guy. Well, you're the same way. You're white and red. Oh, yeah. You're yeah. I'm, I'm almost clear. <laughs> like, like powder that movie yeah, powder. exactly <laughs> I'm a fucking powder <laughs> you kind of look like uh that uh what the hell's his name uh what uh rudolph the red-nosed reindeer with the 
You caught Cordelius. Oh, this is going well. This is, this is a good comparison. <laughs> <laughs> That's what everybody wants to hear. You know, you really look like that motherfucker from the Island of Misfit Toys. Well, he makes everyone happy. Look at it that way. Yeah, yeah. This is this is coming from the guy who used to look like the thing. It's I looked like that rock on Fantastic Four. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the thing, isn't it? Or no? I don't know. It might that's be the thing. I didn't watch it. It's a shit movie anyway. I'm going to ask Siri. <clears throat> What's the name for the rock on a Fantastic Four? Based on three movies matching rock on. No, that's not going to help. Fantastic Four. We'll have... We'll have three no, your fucking Siri's killing me right now. <laughs> oh, Lord. Phil, where's your little one? Is he playing still? He's sleeping in my arms. Oh, is he really? Yeah, he crashed out about 20 minutes ago. Mm. Aaron's talking, put him to sleep. <laughs> no, he I can't hear. I, t- I talk too much. Um, the one thing I think, though, as far as cause we're all into working out, the people sometimes I don't think understand how you build uh, how you build muscle. The, the whole idea of like creatine is uh, it super hydrates your muscles, which allows you a more hydrated muscle makes you lift heavier. The heavier you lift, the deeper it tears your muscles, which gives you the ability or the opportunity for that muscle to grow bigger or grow grow back larger. So like me, I lift like a bitch now, and I just do reps, high reps, and, and low weight to moderate weight. But when I'm lifting heavier, if I want to build muscle, I stay as hydrated as I can, and I lift as heavy as I can. And without getting into the whole CrossFitter debate of rest days, the, the way to build the biggest muscle you can is – Lift as heavy as you can, eat like a starving grizzly, and sleep like a, a grizzly in hibernation to help recover that muscle. So guys that initially take creatine are usually, uh, you know, six to eight pound weight gain, but it's just water weight. That shit's going away when you get off of it because it super hydrates your muscles. The idea is while you're that hydrated, it allows you to lift heavier max reps or max sets. So you take the oppor- you know, you take that opportunity to lift as heavy as you can to, to tear your muscles deeper. Again, I'm not a doctor or a trainer, but for a redneck from Oregon, that's the way I understood it, and um, <laughs> that's the best way to gain muscle. But I was eating 8,000 calories a day when I was that big. My freaking lunchbox was fucking cooler. It was like that. It was, I mean, eating 8,000 calories a day is a task, but it is a lot of work. Oh yeah, and you're going potty a lot. Like, it's not like a a one-time-a-day thing. It's like a a three-hour-a-day thing. In fact, I think they're going to take my lunch break away because I was shitting every two and a half hours. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Oh, man. And I I looked it up. It was the thing. That's the rock guy. Fantastic. I'll take that. You can be Yukon Cornelius. I'll be the thing. He can be a machete or a... (laughs) Machete. (laughs) (laughs) Phil Connor. (laughs) What what is the guy where he's shooting right. his back and shit? And he's firing rounds. What was that called? Where he's a guitar player? Desperado. Desperado. Hey, Desperado. If I gotta get in the sack with Selma Hayek, it will call me whatever you want. Okay. Here's the thing, That's, though. Here's the thing. You almost look like you could be Indian, though. Um. Like dots or aren't, feathers. Aren't we all Indian? I mean, like, didn't everybody no, like come slum from dog, like Slumdog Millionaire? No, but it, I mean, come on now, Will. Let's not get into. Uh, a, a history debate here, but <laughs> didn't the people that lived in this uh, this land before um, the Europeans came over wasn't everybody Indian? Native American. Well, I think that me- they were from. You're Asia. right. I'm sorry, right. Native American from from uh, you know my 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 dad's side of the border in Mexico. They're Indians, okay? Um, Native American Indian, but isn't everybody got a little bit of that somewhere along the line? I don't. I don't think I look like I do. He's got red hair. I do. I know because my uh, Not a my grandpa like me. <laughs> my grandpa on my or my dad's side's half something. Um, so I know I have native. American. That's why I can track so well. Either that or because my friends can't shoot for shit. And I always have to follow bad blood trails. It's one of the two. Uh, oh, he's up. Oh, he's he's uh, yeah, he's gonna be needing some food in a minute. But well, hey, you know what? And and well, let's let's get back to uh. Touching on mountain ops real quick because I'm gonna have to probably get out of here in a minute. So Aaron, if you'd like to re- replenish your uh, electrolytes, you should check out some enduro. I, I encourage you to check out the enduro from from mountain ops. Uh, Will you can sniff the Yeti uh, <laughs> if you need to for your uh, um, you know for whatever getting up for whatever activity you need to get up for. 
But uh, <laughs> other than that, uh, Aaron, do you take anything else? Do you take any of the Blaze or or any, Magnum, any of the other stuff? Magnum just came out. You try that yet? The pro- oh, oh, yeah. Well, for me, that cereal that I eat, uh-huh. that's got a scoop of Magnum in it for protein powder as a substitute for milk. So I make whatever my own cereal and then – I eat that every morning on a backpack hunt. And then the ox I take, which is basically tribulus, which is it, it maximizes your potential output for testosterone. And then I'll take blaze every now and then. It just depends um, on what I like. I Those orange pills, that was blaze that I had with me. So if I'm pooped, I usually throw one of those in. Um, those are the big ones. I need to start taking the renew um, just because I guess it's good for your di- digestive tract. And, uh, you know, we're talking baby's arms, right? Like, yeah. you always talk about poo for stuff. Well, I do or whatever. I don't know why. But if it's a big one, I've got to talk about it, right? And uh, you eat enough butthole sandwiches and uh, protein bars. Something's coming out that you got to talk about. And we had a couple moments where I probably could have used some Renew when we were on the hunt. But, <laughs> but yeah, I used – Pretty much everything Mountain Ops has, I use at one time or another. The Yeti I use more in the off season when I'm lifting heavier, is on a consistent basis. But as far as their protein, the Magnum I use every morning. I have oatmeal with, um, you know, Magnum, or I'll have, um, you know, I'll mix it in with my Greek yogurt. That now that's perfect idea. I do that as well. Maybe some blueberries sometime when I'm allowed to have fruit again. Yeah. yeah. How much weight are you trying to drop there? Uh, I had to drop a total of seven pounds, and so far I've just got like three and a half to go. And now this is for the competition you're about to enter? Yeah, because it's 207 to like 187, I think, is the weight class I, I want to get in. I want to be at the 207 mark, because if I'm like 207 to like 237 or 47, wherever it is, I'm going to get crushed. I wouldn't even so have what, to be competitive. You're, you're at 211 now, then? Yeah, like 210.5, I think. I yeah, just... what's your body fat at? Uh, I was, last time I checked it, it was like 13. Was that water displacement or was that with a caliper or the machine you uh, stand on? Yeah, the machine you stand on, the in-body. We have an in-body yeah. down at the CrossFit I go to, you stand on it. And that's what I've been weighing myself with because I know that's what they're going to use to, because uh, our CrossFit is the one who's kind of put the whole thing together, but it's going to be the city of Utica, like citywide. They're holding it out behind the auditorium, this Utica Memorial Auditorium, and so it'll be pretty cool, pulling trucks, throwing kegs, uh, log press, and some other some other stuff. Is there anybody up there that can just crush you in that 207 class, or do you think you'll yeah, be pretty it's, good? Yeah, it's, it's a solid class. It's a solid class. Like most, I know most of the guys can get the kegs over. Like if, if the wins, the you know, the difference between first and second is going to be like maybe one toss or how many seconds, you know, how long. It, if everyone get, clears all the kegs, it'll be who got them over faster. And for the truck pull, it's going to be, uh, you know, just seconds. Everything's going to be seconds and maybe one or two reps. Yeah, yeah. I've entered some stuff like that when I was large but naturally large and not, you know, where I was a little bit better athlete, not just strength because you fuck around and die pulling a truck if you're not ready for cardio that's one of the hardest cardio events i've ever done um was the truck pull yeah i'm i'm looking forward to it i'm looking forward to it. it's something different you know just a change of pace from uh the train to hunt cha- training which i still feel like i was I'm pretty good shape of but i feel like uh compared to train to hunt standing and just having to be strong in one place is a little more of my strength than running around yeah yeah yeah, that's one thing with the train to hunt. Phil and I were talking about that, um, the different events and, you know, what, um, you know, because I'm kind of an advocate. I talked to Kenton of doing a lot more applied stuff for hunting, and, and Kenton has his reasons for what he does and everything else because I'd like to see just a straight-up six-mile in with 40 pounds back out with 80 to 100 for six miles, like a true backpack-type um, event like that where you're not just seeing – short bursts and there's nothing wrong with short bursts but from what phil and i just did that shit makes the rubber meet the road because it's the long grind i mean you can suffer through anything mentally for a short period of time but if you suffer that shit for i mean a good 12 mile pace is is three hours if you could do 12 miles in three hours that's four miles an hour and i think that would be a whether or not he'll ever do it or there'll be a race with that i think that would be a good event yeah yeah it definitely would be i think uh something like that would be cool. Maybe even going 
uh, more strength heavy, just mix it up. But who who knows what will come down the road. I'd like to see maybe, you know, an event where you have to sit in a tree stand and who, who can hold their pee the longest. That would be more applicable to the eastern hunting. Applicable? Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Yeah. You know, you could put a, one of those heater body suits on and throw out some Khmer deer and some swamp donkey and some corn and shit, too. <laughs> swamp donkey. <laughs> swamp donkey. <laughs> I don't even know what that shit is. I was on the cardio machine and I saw that come up on the TV. Isn't it something that deer eat? Swamp yeah, donkey like or something? Yeah, it's deer attractant of some sort, like a, like a pelletized. I think it's pelletized. I don't fucking know. I'm, I, haven't used I don't know if, it, if she I'm made that shit. I'm donkey. Tell you guys, do a review on it. I might have packed that in if I thought she made it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I could bring the tarp, but I brought the swamp donkey. <laughs> I brought the comb. You don't have any hair. Oh, Lord. Well, should we wrap this up? I think yeah. I've made an ass of myself hey, enough to open. If if Mountain Ops isn't treating you good, they're not hooking hook, hooking you up with any deals. You can enter NBH20 and get 20% off your next Mountain Ops order. Oh, gotcha! I appreciate that. Hey, you're welcome. Just trying to help you out here, you know. <laughs> no, no but I just gave I just gave Casey a thousand dollar backpack. I want some Magnum. He better ship that shit out quick. <laughs> <laughs> Casey's <laughs> uh, cool. He's funny. We talk not, all the time. Not to be on our pro staff. We're just we're just still trying to help you out. You, I appreciate you, it. And you can get all the flatties you want. Twenty percent off all the flatty bills too. If you want? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Uh, now, I just want you, Con Cornelius, to sign that damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, sign, I'll sign one and send it out to you. I got an ice axe you can use because he had one. Phil saw it. I'll send it to you. I'll sign it. <laughs> Perfect. From the, from the thing. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to shit talk to Casey again to get another hat though. This one took a little while. Now Phil's jealous. This whole thing I am jealous. I'm behind the scenes. That's all you good though. Like you got a pretty big ass dome on you. What do you? I would imagine most hats look like a yarmulke. How big is that thing? Me, I usually rock a seven and three eighths. I think is my my fitted hat hat size. Oh, that's not too bad. If no, you get too right. skinny, you're gonna look like an avocado on a toothpick, though. Especially with that the camo hat. I'm I'm okay with that because although I'll look like a toothpick <laughs> with an anaconda, so you know perception. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, what's that code again, Phil? NBH twenty. Replenish your electrolytes with Enduro. Check out Magnum if you want the whey protein. Well, uh, you know what, man? Just if you haven't tr- checked them out yet, get mountainops.com. Yeah. NBH20 on your promo code. That's right. NBH20 gets you 20% off your supplements. And, you know, in the meantime, if you can, stay away from steroids and uh, Panamanian horizons. <laughs> Yes, yes. Both of those bad. And I vote this, for you, Con Cornelius. <laughs> This is right on, guys. The Natural Born Hunter podcast. Everybody out there, I hope you're having a fantastic day. Uh, wake up, chase your dreams, repeat.